Hi, I'm Coach MK, founder of the Fitness Protection Program. I'm a run coach, not a life coach. But we're never really talking about the running. Running is the tool. It's the conduit we use to examine the world we live in, as well as its impact on our own lives and the lives of the people around us. How we react to certain people and to certain stories tells us a lot about how we view ourselves. I'm committed to the thoughtful, intentional exploration of the importance of running so that no one discounts their own badassery, ever. Final note, this podcast is geared towards every runner who won't lose their home, livelihood, or health insurance if they show up to the corral with a hangover. Not that I'm encouraging you to do that, just saying. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the Fitness Protection Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and friends beyond the binary, it's time for the podcast. Excellent. Thank you, Cheyenne. Thank you for coming and talking to us, Cheyenne. That was so much fun. Welcome. That was really cute. Oh my gosh. It'll, I, I don't know if it was going to be cute enough to offset the screams when your husband has to start washing Hello Kitty off of her face. Oh my God. I do, not, I do not envy him right now. I, poor guy. I mean, I'm just saying my husband had five kids, five on Saturday morning, because part of the fun thing about ADHD and being unmedicated, like this right here is exactly the sort of thing that is happening now where I'm like, I need to get back on medication. So we invited, and, and I totally planned this. Cheyenne asked, can we please have a sleepover? You said I could have, have to over her sleepover at some point this summer. I had texted her mom a long time ago and forgot to follow up. And we got set it up right away. And then I put it on the calendar because if it's not in Google, in my Google calendar, it's not going to happen. And I totally oh. forgot. And I remembered at 3.30 on Friday afternoon, we had promised we'd pick her up at four. Like that's when I get the notification. I'm like, oh, by the way, you need to run down to 25 East Dakota. <laughs> and this complicates the entire pickup process. This com- and my husband's just like, wait, what? What? They, I mean, sleepovers, they don't sleep. Saturday morning, I wake up early, not as early as I normally would, but like early for me now, out the door, drive out. I really should have canceled my long run in Centennial. Came back, I did with coffee at eight in the morning, and I, he was just like, he was so <laughs> not, I mean, the look on his face, he was so not impressed with me in that moment. I was like, yeah. No. Mm-hmm, uh, and mm-hmm. then that threw off the entire plan for the day, and then today was thrown off too. So with that in mind, I've been working most of the day today and I did not work as much as I normally would yesterday. I was taking one or two of the bigger kids out so that they would leave Cheyenne and her sleepover buddy alone because, you know, they wanted to pull mm-hmm. things. Yep, yep, yep. Bruise now. Um, anyway, so it's like, and it was, it was actually fortuitous that you needed to reschedule the podcast recording for that reason. Um, we were kind of, it wasn't the same type of shit show, but it was definitely a little messy around yeah. here. So yeah. Well, and I really, I appreciate you being willing to let me reschedule because oh, it, was, it, it, it was um, kind of a literal shit show in my life, actually. You know, TMI, sorry, that people who are the parents of three and three and a half year olds might be able to relate. We're definitely going through a battle of the wills thing right now. And my daughter loves any way that she can demonstrate that she doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> I kind of respect that. I kind of do too, but it is massively inconvenient for me. I understand. I completely, (laughs) completely understand. Yeah. Yes, I know you do. You definitely do. So (laughs) today is much improved over yesterday. I'm very glad we found a little bit of an equilibrium. Although, yeah, Roz, Roz went to a street festival and got her face painted with a princess kitty, which was her request. And now her dad, as we record this, is going to have to not only wash her hair, which she hates, but also wash the princess kitty off her face. And oh, I'm, I'm praying Tristan. for both of them. I know, poor Tristan. I'm mostly praying for him. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, there's some, I'm, I'm really glad that we have been able to get him some serious hands-on dad experience. Yes. Well, he, he, he's told me a few times that he likes to think of himself as the silent hero of the fitness protection podcast. So yes. I feel like we, I feel like we can give that to him. I mean, let's sing his praises. Thank you, Tristan. We couldn't do this without you. We also could not do this without the team of people that have been working for free to make all this happen. Uh, the, not, not least of which is coach Sarah, uh, Chrissy Zarnock, who is our amazing, incredible podcast editor who, when she volunteered oh for the role, here. Did Love not understand she was going to be cleaning up the, the audio from Ask Coach and 
uh, the new long form podcast and two little bitty podcasts from, uh, from Sarah each week. And she's handled all of this with the plum. Um, and I'm still, I'm impressed every single day that she still like answers when, when I, when I call or text, but we're, we're grateful for you, Chrissy. We could not do this without you. You are so fabulous, Chrissy. We love you so much. You're, you're- and if you have gotten hit the sign up button on the coach MK or fitness protection pages, actually, I definitely know it's up on coach MK. It might not be up on fitness protection yet. But if you hit sign up, you will be signed. What you're effectively signing up for there is the weekly content roundup. I've been told that we produce so much that it's really hard to keep up with. I want there to be a variety of entertainment available to anyone in different forms. Video, for obvious reasons, tends to be considerably easier than trying to write things and get it formatted and make sure that people hear my voice in their head when they read it. Because sometimes that happens, but not always. And that only works actually if you actually if you've heard me or know me in some context first. So to that end, we have somebody that has been doing a lot of design work for free and you can get the first bit of it if you sign up for the weekly content roundup email that's going to start going out next week and there'll be an immediate uh, downloadable pdf gift from us saying thank you and if you've already signed up for other email lists you do need to sign up again to opt into this one too sorry for that but that's how they keep businesses even small ones from like buying up email lists and just putting people on them like this double yeah, opt-in yeah. Yeah. that everyone who gets it actually wants to and we are in favor of that yeah good stuff yeah, I, I'm so excited. What a day indeed. I'm just waiting for the screams. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like filler. <laughs> I know. Filler. I, I Seriously, I'm holding my breath here. So far, I hear a little bit of singing. I don't know, man. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe, maybe we've already been through like the big meltdown moment of the evening. I just don't nope. know. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Is that, mo- is that a moment where you get like complacent and you sort of think, oh, we, we survived. That's, that's when it kicks in. Exactly. Exactly. I think we got to go ahead and do our thing. And whenever the screams start, we'll just smile and uh, (laughs) get through it somehow. And then a really angelic child with wet hair and a clean face will walk in to say, I love you, MK. She always asks for MK. Whenever we start doing exercises, she's like, can we have MK? Can we turn on MK? I love that. I love her. (laughs) That's so sweet. I really can't wait to get her and shine together. That'll be ridiculous. That will be so great. That's going to be an amazing day. I'm looking forward to it. And Shiloh, too. I feel like she and Shiloh would be a dangerous combination. In a Shiloh way. is a hot mess right now. And I, I love I love it. And I love her. And I, I love all my kids. But like somebody said something to me that I thought was completely inane when I, uh, back when, in the days when I only, only had one job. <laughs> uh, woman had seven. And I was just like, wow. I, I, I could not comprehend how that would even happen. Like, how do you leave the house? How do you shop? How do you do anything? They were all, there was seven under five. Yeah. And, huh, right? Wow. But, right. And she was like, eh, it's just more love. And I, at the moment, in the moment I heard that, I thought that was the dumbest thing I'd ever heard. And now I'm like, oh, I kind of get it. I can't, I don't know that I could say it with a straight face for seven kids under five. It really, on a good day, it really does feel just like, you know, more snuggles when they're on top of me on the couch. But on a day when they're not happy and they're off schedule, like yesterday, my husband's just kind of like, what have we done? Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the what have we done feeling has occasionally kicked in even with the one kid. It pops its little head in not infrequently these days. But also we were, we were laying on the couch yesterday morning before Roz got up kind of talking about like, what the hell are we going to do about this whole like, I refuse to go to the bathroom when I clearly have to thing. And I was like, you know what? She just doesn't care. Like she just does not hair and he just started laughing and I was like you know what else she doesn't care about eating her boogers she was singing a song about eating her boogers yesterday and I said to her Roz you know lots of people think that's pretty yucky and it's really not a good idea she's like I don't care I love it and he was just like you know what she's great <laughs> you know <laughs> and I was like it's true she is but also <laughs> someone has to teach her these things well, I figure like she's got the rest of her life to learn how much shame already exists in the world. Exactly. There's a saying in Japanese, the nails that sticks out will be driven back in. The mm. parts of bras that are truly socially unacceptable will in fact be driven back in by the time she gets yeah. to public school, especially mm-hmm. in Boston, where conforming, yeah. I'm guessing, looks a little bit different than it did in Smith County, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's, that, that is my thinking also, that it is not, it is not, not my introduced game earlier than it's going to come in. Yeah. And we both are like, you know, amused and kind of impressed by the ways in which she's just like, I'm going to do what I want and I don't care. And we're like, oh, okay. Yep. All right. That was the thing. Like I, my, my parents were always like, I get it. 
but you've got to own it. If you are going to go against the grain, you've got to know what the grain okay. is. Yeah. Decide if you are deliberately defying it, because if you're deliberately mm-hmm. defying the standard, that inherently means you're accepting the standard. You're not really being a rebel. So if you're good, being a rebel is, is doing your own thing, but you got to know what that is and the, oh, and the consequences for it. And I was like, okay. And I totally missed that lesson. And I completely understand. Everything to me was a negotiation. If you do this, you're going to get spanking. Worth it. So now that I'm in this, this position with my kids, it's, I just sort of smile. I'm like, you know what? She's not going to eat her boogers when she's 17. Yeah. You know, <laughs> she's going to like hey. something at some point who's going to be like, you still peeing your pants. This is ridiculous. And it's going to, it's going to end. Or mm-hmm. some girl. I don't know. I don't care. Something is going to, the world will, will shape them. It's my, it's my job to make sure that they're paired. This is generally considered to be socially unacceptable, but I'm like, I'm, I'm picking my battles and I'm not picking this one any longer. Half fun. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You heard it here first. Listen, she still wears a Moana nightgown to school four days out of five. (laughs) Eight months after she got the thing for Christmas. So yeah, no, I agree. Good for her. You know, yesterday, that dress back there, I got a wild hair. Thought I wonder if it fits yet. It's for the the book lover's ball and the family photos. And it does fit finally. And I'm like, oh, amazing. Things are starting to move back in the right direction. Yay. Yay. I I was super excited. So all the girls got dressed up too. And we ended up having a tea party downstairs in the middle of the afternoon. And it was a whole lot of fun. So I say, hang on to the Moana stuff because it is so much fun. Right, Cheyenne? Right. Well, the reason we are chit-chatting so liberally is because we don't have any questions in Rebuild and we have four questions to maintain. And lots of people know that Chrissy is turning this into an amazing podcast. So they are like doing their own thing on Sunday night, which is also great. Well, understandable. Yeah. I get it. But you still got to ask his questions. If you have questions, you can put them in the Facebook groups. If you're not a member of the Facebook groups, but are part of the Fitness Protection Program, you can always email your questions to info at coachandlove.com. Yeehaw. Other things that we would like you to email us about. We tried a slightly different tack this week, last week too, with our long form podcast. My husband and I did a Facebook Live. I had to tell a little story that we hoped would underscore some of the points that we hit on in the podcast. Uh, Last week, he told a story about a crash diet uh, that he had to complete in a short period of time to make weight for the Navy. And that was the lead up into what I think will probably always be referred to as the Beyonce podcast, where we talked about the the wide ranging, but very strong reactions to her advertisement for 22 days. This week, he told a different story about a time he did something that he became known for for a while in business school. And we still had to hear about as recently as our 10 year reunion as a joke. It was a moment where he made a choice to call out a rule that was being broken that was probably more hall monitor than helpful. So mm-hmm. we'll see. If you like this format, if you think this is interesting, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, email info at coachedandlove.com and let me know. Um, also check out the latest on the blog over at coachedandlove.com backslash blog. And you can see the post that we put up tonight with the weekly content roundup, having links to all of the live streams, all the podcasts, the cool things that we've done this week, everything other than the Instagram posts. And I know we put out a lot of content, but we hope by collecting it in one place with a note from me and Coach Sarah each week is a nice touch point and a segment I'm kind of excited about now that people have finally really started using the hashtags on Instagram the way that I have requested. We can have a winner of the week. So we're winning at life, hashtag winning at life. And we want to highlight a member of the fitness protection program who is in fact winning at life in some way, shape or form. So yeah, don't forget whenever you are posting uh, specifically on Instagram, use the hashtag coached and loved hashtag fitness protection LLC. And we will be sure to see it. And as far as we're concerned, that's all we need to see to consider yourself submitted for winning at life. We want to try to highlight one of you every single week. Let us know how you're winning at life and how we helped you in the process. That sounds amazing. I love it. I'm so excited. I love it when people, you know, talk about their wins on Facebook and the Facebook groups. I especially love it when there are pictures. So please do, you know, tag us on Instagram, participate in that. We would really love that. Totally. Totally. We got a lot of stuff coming down the pike for the fall. Like I can't wait to have Coach Sarah full time. The way I see it, we just got to get through August. And I, what I think that my biggest disappointment of the day was finding out this is not, in fact, your last week at Harvard. I really thought it was. Oh. When? Well, I, I, I every week kind of like, like when Roz started getting the, the the kitty cat washed off. That's the sound I made when you told me that. <gasps> oh, I'm so sorry. I hate disappointing people. We're getting there. We're getting very close. This is my second and last week, but this is the week that the person who's taking my place is going to start. So this is the week that I am working with her, making sure that I give her ownership of all the shared Google Docs and access to all the things. 
And then next week, August 12th to 16th, that will be my last week. August 16th is the last day. It's starting to feel pretty soon. Uh, I can't it's wait. It's so soon. I can't wait. I need <laughs> I need so much. Help. I need a production manager. I've got all these projects and it's not like, yes, some of it's ADHD, but a lot of it's just like, there's no way I can do all of it by myself. Yeah. I definitely generate a lot of work. And that's good. But the most efficient way that I work when it comes to content production is to get something started and then hand it off to someone else to kind of complete. Like when Mm -hmm. I put the Mm MKNIS in it and then I'm like, you know what to do from here and you know what to do from here and you know what to do from here. And right now I've got no one to hand it to and no mechanism always making me circle back around to it. So there are a lot of things that are unfinished and I can't wait to tie off those loose ends and start building towards bigger things. Yeah, me either. I, I always feel like there are so many things that I want to like follow up on and dig into and chew on. Plus my own blog, which I like have gotten started on blog posts so many times, but the amount of time that it takes to really get it right and make me feel like, yes, okay, I want to post this. I want to share it. I just, I have not had that. That's, I think, been the biggest struggle for me is going from really writing regularly and feeling like, you know, I had this nice audience that was paying attention to feeling like I write so rarely. And any time that I take to do that is this extra time that I have to somehow like sort of apologize for and fit it not not with you but with my family certainly Saturday morning was like my time where I could have left the house and gone and written a bunch of stuff but I was like but it's Saturday morning and I specifically make Saturday my rest day so that I can be here at home and like chilling in my pajamas with everybody and I don't want to just like disappear off and do this and but I feel bad because I haven't posted on my blog and ugh. so I'm really excited to have weekdays back to be able to work on the stuff that's really important to me like everything that we're doing here. I'm excited to be able to record podcasts on weekdays instead of during Roz's nap time on the weekend. Yes. <laughs> That's going to be so great. It's just going to free us up to do so much more and talk to each other so much more. Because frankly, when it yes. comes to the writing, there are certain things only I can write, but a lot of other things I can be like, oh, you take this, you take yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I'm looking forward to that because when one of the bigger functions of ADHD is a state of hyper-focus. And I kind of mm-hmm. touched on it last week, but... The way it is generally described to someone who doesn't have it is when you're interested in something, you can cultivate the focus and go for a really long time. And that's true. But it almost sounds a little trite. Like the way it's, it's interpreted is that you can only really focus on the things that you enjoy. And I'm like, well, I think that's all humans. It, but you can shame people with that ADHD into just getting things done. And that doesn't work. We're, we're like, well, I'm already malfunctioning. I mean, you, you're putting shame on top of it. It's no longer an effective stick to beat me with. Sorry, you're going to have to go find a new one. Am I flawed or are you flawed or are you just a lazy manager? Let's figure this out. So to that in mind, it'll be nice to the have a work flow. writing I don't want to do. To be like, can you do this? Because I get the sense, you know, you're Dr. Sarah Lerman Axelrod of Harvard University. Like, there's nothing you can't. You want to gravitate everything you do. I'll be like, can you bring, you could probably bang these things out. Whereas I just sit and look at a piece of paper. And then I'll spend 75 minutes writing a Facebook post. And I don't realize it's taking 75 minutes and that I really don't need nine paragraphs to explain the thought that I'm trying to set down. You know, like this whole <laughs> thing from, that Phyllis tagged me in could wait, but it couldn't wait at the same time. And that is the crux, the executive management function. And, ADHD. If you look on Instagram, there's a picture I posted this morning. I'll end on this. And it's Homer Simpson sitting like mostly naked on the floor playing with remote control trains while everyone behind him is standing dressed by the door. And at the bottom, it says, I, let me just get my shoes. I'm ready to go. And I'm like, yeah, that's pretty much me whenever my husband says it's time to go. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'll only be like five minutes. Like, no, it's, it's never just putting shoes on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I, I mean, listen, <laughs> I really appreciate your respect for my skills, but also like writing a doctoral dissertation, there is a lot of staring at a piece of paper that happened in those years. So uh, <laughs> like I am, so, I, I am as, I am as capable of writer's block as the next person. The thing about the writing that I do for, for this protection for the morning mantra is like, sometimes it's two 30 on a Monday and I leave my office at three on Mondays to go pick up Roz. It's one of my earlier days. And I'm like, it's 2.30. I need to record a podcast for tomorrow. Okay. Okay. And an idea comes and, and I don't feel intimidated by it anymore the way that I used to be. And the writing just kind of comes. And then it takes five minutes to record. And then I'm at the door picking up bras. And that used to be a really, really long process for me. It would take hours and hours of thinking and, you know, kind of mm-hmm. workshop whatever. And then I would have to record it multiple times and try and get it right. And I feel like I I have been sort of inhabiting this role in a different way, in a way that I feel more comfortable and where I do feel more capable of like, okay, this is what I have to write now. All right. 
like this is let's let's sit down and make this happen and- well it's like a vein if you know how to tap it and I say this as um when I was an undergrad a friend of mine was in the nursing school at Georgetown and she would practice and practice and practice and practice, and practice. it was the she was evidently she was like I swear every time they give me I always get the person with the veins that starts to stick she's like once you found it they talk about it so you can find it and every person, and it's just not true. And I've never completely forgotten that because that's how subject matter feels in my ADHD brain. Like, oh, you just need to learn how to focus. And once you do, and I'm like, no, that's, that's, that's not it. But when I can tap into the same vein over and over and over, when I can find a role that allows me to do that and celebrates my ability to do that, I shine. And that's like the mantra. I've been doing this for 20 years. I can pull them out of my hat with, like, I could stand on stage, take them from an audience and create them with a whiteboard behind me. That, yeah. like, that's how efficient I am at making them now. When I first got started, I was really intimidated by all the recording equipment and how I sound because I'd been made to feel really awkward by that point about like, I talk too fast, I talk too much, I ramble, I forget what I'm talking about, all of which is absolutely true. What I didn't think of though is like how this is a superpower to someone who's asking for a mantra. So I once I stopped trying to overcomplicate it, step back and just be like, you know what? Here's my reaction, what you just said. And it comes out, that's what you're here for. The person that's like, got your back and is going to be biting back or supporting when there's no support. You can usually determine what a person needs to get out of out of the writing. And like, you know why they're coming to us instead of Abby or something else. And it's not accessibility. All right, are you ready to dive in some questions? I'm ready to dive into some questions. I think I am going to ask you all these questions because, yeah, I I, I read through them and, and I want you to answer them. So I'm going to read the questions. Number one, can you pretty please discuss and demonstrate the chair test that Coach MK referenced as a benchmark for readiness for marathon ramp up? I see different chair tests on the interwebs, but I am not sure if they are the right ones. Thank you. There are multiple chair tests. This is true. And remember, I'm not a physical therapist. I am just someone that works closely with one, Alex Lanton of Atlas Physical Therapy in Stapleton. To be specific, if you're going to Atlas, great. But if if you're not going to Alex at Atlas, I don't know you. They're all plenty of good people, but I coordinate specifically with Alex on my athletes. So the chair test, I'll show it. It's kind of like a one-legged getup is the easiest way to describe it. Mm -hmm. And Which we didn't maintain a couple months ago. No one is a good and objective assessor of their own capabilities at any moment. So it's always best to have someone who knows what they're doing and exactly how it's administered. I pay attention. And this is really low and I'm probably going to fail, FYI. So I'm sitting in the chair and I'm sitting with my sits bones toward the edge of it. And all we really want to do is rise without leaning for it as far as I did just then. A few things we're looking for is my foot is not over the midline of the body and that I'm using my glutes and my core to do all of the lifting to get me up. Normally, to get out of something this low, people are going to be like pushing forward, you know, and that's kind of the opposite of what we want. We want to be able to like rise gently. It's hard. And the lower the seat, the harder it is. But that is literally all it is. Can you rise from a seated position about halfway back in a reasonable chair, not a super high chair, definitely not a low chair, just a reasonable chair, desk office chair is fine. Can you rise out of that chair on one leg without losing your balance, your knee uh, rotating inward? That is a lot of glute specific work. Can you do it? So when runners hear you need glute strength, usually what they're being told is you can't pass the chair test. If you're not receptive to that information, you're just going to argue. My glutes are fine. Sure they are. But until I know, if I'm training you one-on-one, until I know for sure that you can and do pass the chair test, I will not put you on a track. I will not have you doing hill repeats. I might put hills into your workout, but specific hill repeats. You can't stand one-legged out of a chair without that knee going inward. Then nothing good is going to happen when we have you hitting artificial speeds on a track. And nothing good is going to happen if we have you replicating uh, that same movement in a different plane of motion up a hill. So that's the what and the why. All right. So hopefully you can see in the video that MK just did, if you are watching this live, if you are listening on the podcast, again, look, go ahead and take a video of this and post it in the Facebook group if you want one of us to take a look at it. But know that we can't really pronounce whether you're passing the chair test or not. Um, You really need to know the answer to do I pass the chair test? You need to go to a physical therapist who knows what they're doing, what they're looking for. That is true. Okay, so we have two short questions about the taper. So I'm going to read them both together and then we can talk taper. Number one, can you talk about the taper? Do you have a taper template? How far out from the race to cut back on long runs and hard stuff? Thank you. Second question, please remind me of what a half marathon taper looks like. Is it two weeks or two weeks before? Thanks. 
Go. Mm, it depends. I'm assuming that first question is a taper for for what? I mean, we got to be a little specific yeah. about it. For whom and how? So what a taper is, is that we're decreasing both duration and intensity for towards a certain period to reach maximum critical power in an athlete. So if we were playing around in training peaks and looking at you as a widget and not a fully formed human and all the data that I'm looking at, because that's all I can see from us to my clients, what we're trying to do is reduce your training load and reduce your fatigue in the period leading up to a race as much as we can without impacting your fitness or your readiness so that on race day, you can generate higher than normal uh, levels of critical power. If you read my Nuzzle newsletter last week or the outtakes, I think it was actually in the outtakes, I included a story about Alex Hutchison. If you don't follow his blog, Sweat Science, you really should. Everything he writes is fantastic and he's a really terrific human. But he was writing about the reason most marathoners hit the walls because they run out of critical power. And again, I think a lot of the data that we have in the research, the underlying data sets are all pointing to elite and professionals. And that's less of a concern in a non-elite runner. So like the trade-off there is contingent upon fitness level, right? So the type of taper we need is going to be very different from a Molly Huddle right? She needs maximum power so that she can kick past whoever happens to be left standing when her pack gets near the breakaway point or to keep up if someone else tries to break away sooner. Most of us aren't racing against other people. We're racing against what we did the last time or our own personal goals. To really get the best out of yourself, you got to master that dynamic first. So Mm -hmm. I would argue that critical threshold or critical power of finding that threshold, it's way less important. It's so unimportant, in ma- as a matter of fact, in my non-elite runners that it's not something I measure. So this is not necessarily off topic, but you ask why the taper exists. That's why. Most of the plans that you will ever see are written for not us. They are written for the people that are considerably fitter, that have been doing this a whole lot longer, and for whom you know that trade-off between endurance and power means money in the bank. For you and me, all we got to do is not die. All we got to do is not be stupid. All we got to do is not do anything egregiously dumb in the weeks leading up, back off a little bit, and we're going to be okay. Most of my elite have only a 10-day taper. And the 10-day taper is just, we don't ratchet down the intensity. There's nothing more intense than there. For a marathon, there would be nothing more intense than marathon goal pace. And for anything shorter, like a 5K, there would be nothing more intense than the 5K pace. If it's a 10K, guess what? Nothing more intense than the 10K pace, right? So your intensity is capped at what's required uh, for the race distance. And then the duration starts slowly ratcheting back as we get closer to race day. Within that is why we need them to show up fresh with the maximum amount of power and the untired legs as humanly possible. So they're ready to go. If you've ever taken a day or two off and then shown up again, you're like, I feel amazing. That's kind of why. I prefer, and I find that most of my non-elite clients though, do better with a sharper drop-off and a shorter taper than a longer, more drawn out one that would be appropriate for someone that really needs to work the critical power threshold, Hmm. which doesn't make us lesser. It's just a very different concern. So if you were to go Googling, if that's the information you would find, again, the first question I think, well, that I ask myself when I'm reading it, who is this geared towards? Who like know your target audience is marketing 101. Okay, great. This person that wrote this, who is their target audience? Am I their audience? If not, why? If so, right. why? And being able that to me, and that's very ADHD, but that's me connecting to the material and being absolutely certain that I know what did I come to get? Am I going to get it? Because if I miss it, the stakes are higher. I have ADHD and the chances of me being accused of not doing the work, not doing the reading, not understanding what I saw or trying to get the cliff notes and being called stupid is very, very high. The rate of imposter syndrome, people with ADHD tends to be higher than average for that reason. For that difference in processing is often interpreted as stupidity or presented to us as stupidity and laziness. Ergo, anything I do, I'm a master the F out of it before I talk about it. And most of the stuff that I've seen on taper is not geared towards us because people like us, broadly and generally speaking, don't want to pay for coaches. So the research is geared towards those who, where the money's at. Yeah, Hopefully, okay. in bad life, we're going to change that game of fitness protection. But for now, that's the, you know, the value of that one-on-one coaching is through understanding those relationships and massaging the numbers accordingly. Yeah, totally. So do we have like sort of a boilerplate answer for a half marathon taper and what that looks like two weeks or just the week before? Or are we going to say like, it really depends on what you want out of this race and how you're planning on racing it? What would be your answer to that? I mean, the answer to every question will always be, it depends. Yeah. <laughs> always. Right. And we kind of work our way forward because I could give a whole bunch of standard template answers that you've heard 
heard before, but in my opinion, then I wouldn't be doing my job. My yeah. job is to take the best of what's out there and synthesize it towards your specific needs. And so when it comes to the half marathon, what does a half marathon training plan look like? What is a half marathon taper? The truth of the matter is if we're not worried about that critical power threshold in the taper, we're probably not that worried about it through the training. And that's not, again, it's not a bad thing. It's like, there's only so much we can worry about and still have fun as effectively a hobby jogger that's here for fitness. So we can stress out a lot and it's still not going to move the needle very much. It's more like, I want more. What do I do next? So Mm -hmm. When we talk about 5K specific workouts, 10K specific workouts, all of that once more is geared towards the critical power threshold required to dominate others in an event that should last X amount of minutes. And that's where it comes in. So I could give you a template based off of that, but that is probably still going to be more intensity than you need. You cannot go wrong with the the same sort of taper that I put in the marathon. And that's capping all the midweek runs at 60 minutes, which they are anyway, Mm -hmm. no less than 45, no more than 60, divided into thirds, a warm up, a cool down, and in the middle is one by ones, one minute hard followed by one minute easy. So in again, basic math, if it's a 60 minute workout divided by three, that's 20 minutes each. 20 minute warm up, 20 minute cool down, 20 minutes, a one by one, that's 10 sets of two minutes. And of those two minutes, one minute hard, which is your half marathon effort, focus on effort more than pace, one minute easy. This is not about contingent upon like getting it right and predicting the race accurately. So I know what to do now. That doesn't matter. We remember, we, our ranges are much wider than the range of a Steph Rothstein who like might be racing a marathon at 540, but then her 5K pace is like a 518, right? So think about that. That is a narrow, narrow, narrow range. That's, they got, they got to get it just exactly right. For us, I'm like, my marathon pace, it's like a nine minute mile. My 5K pace is like maybe a 745. Whee! That's a lot of room to maneuver and a lot less need to worry. Yay for more room. Thank God we're not elite. That's a lot more to stress out about. And frankly, you know, we can make this as complicated as you want to, but it's not necessarily going to move the needle to improve the outcome. So with that, the one by ones on Monday and Wednesday of week one of the taper, then cut that down further. So if it was 60 minutes on week one of the taper, then on race week, I would be 45 minutes total with the same format for one by one workout divided by thirds. I would do a stride sandwich the next day of the same duration. So 46 minutes. Day three, one by ones, total workout, same idea, dividing it by thirds for 30 minutes. 20 minutes jogging with accelerators at the end. Day off, race. Yeah. That's or two days off, race if it's on a Sunday. That's a pretty good race week right there. And so then the week before that... Monday, Wednesday, one by one, 60 minutes. Okay. Tuesday, as written, that stride sandwich. Mm-hmm. Thursday off. Friday, uh, 45 minutes dry sandwich and cap mm-hmm. your long run at 95 minutes. Okay. So the, the, the long run the week before the race, cap it at 95 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And if you want to run the last mile at half marathon effort, feel free. But remember, faster isn't better. And this is one of the reasons why I don't like throwing them out there willy nilly. People kind of want to squeeze in a little more work. Mm -hmm. And that's not how it works. That's the opposite of what we're trying to do in the taper. In the taper, we're going towards fresh legs on Mm -hmm. race day. You're not going to improve your fitness level with one or two or three miles here or there. The way people talk about race pace miles, it's like Harry Potter and the magic pace. It doesn't work that way. Specificity really demands that we just need to be fit enough to cover the distance. How much intensity we throw in, more is not necessarily better. You know, you've got to earn the hard workouts by doing all of the easy ones. And you can always throw in anytime you want to and you feel like at a 30 minute easy effort run in the evening during your training, we cannot do willy nilly go and throw in like 30 more minutes or even more than one or two excess miles at race effort during the week without upsetting the apple cart. That's just going to catch up with you really quickly. All right. I think that was a good answer. If you have follow-up questions, let us know in the Facebook groups. Next question. Could you elaborate on last week's question about maintaining heart rate under 140? The answer was that heart rate should be below 140 for the first hour, but after the hour, it seemed like the suggestion was to maintain a pace. I thought a key aspect of heart rate training is heart rate below 140. Subsequent hours, we should focus on pace. Is heart rate disregarded? I wouldn't say disregarded. That's going too far the other way. What I care about is that your head is in the game and it stays in the game for the long term. I've heard the, the phrase cardiac drift tossed around and it bothers me because it's what I'm looking for in cardiac drift is in one of my elite runners when they're at the end of like hour two of a long run and their long runs, by the way, like the, remember, these are people that are going to finish the marathon in two hours and 30 minutes or less. So a two hour long run is, is pretty egregiously long for them, almost longer net net than what I would have a non-elite person do. 
if you were to, you know, do it by percentages. It's cardiac drift is when their heart rate starts ticking upwards for the same effort level um, when it shouldn't. Okay. And so the fitter the person, the bigger the problem cardiac drift is in a long workout. And that drift usually starts at the end of the first hour. If a person is headed towards overtrained, if they're battling some sort of injury and they haven't mentioned it to me, if they have gut issues, it can be a signal of something bigger, not necessarily something dangerous, like they're going to have a heart attack. It's more like, okay, what's been going on? Like, you know, you didn't sleep last night. You haven't been sleeping. Your nutrition's been off. You've had, you know, tummy troubles. It can be a variety of things and all of which are, you know, terrible for a runner, but benign from like a medical perspective. Right. So when I hear non-elite runners talk about cardiac drift, I'm like, no, that's just what happens. That's a measure of fitness. So if you're relatively new to heart rate training, or if you're doing your long run at the hardest part of the day, do the best you can to keep your heart rate under 140 for at least the first hour, because all of the long runs in maintain, I think they top out at two hours and 30 minutes. So if you're giving me at least like at least the first hour. This is more me begging you. This is not permission to throw the rule out the window. This is me begging you like, look, I know it's a hot day, especially if you live in Florida or Arizona and the only time you can run is noon. If we will not go indoors, if we do not have any other options, if this is what you're going to do and you're mad at me because you're like, well, this is the only time I can run and I'm walking in these conditions. I'm like, look, try to give me at least an hour under 140 and then do whatever you got to do to get through it. That's more what I'm talking about. Not like, oh, it doesn't matter. Ha ha ha, kidding. That's not what I'm saying at all. Also, when it comes to a person who's super duper demoralized when they look at their pace, and that, by the way, right now is this girl. I'm amongst you. Like, I went for a run on Saturday and I was like, my heart rate was where it needed to be. My pace did not look egregious, but boy, it's hilly. And my lungs were not ready to do that work and neither were my ankles. My ankles were mad. We don't talk enough, actually, about the critical adaptations that need to happen in your tendons, joints, and ligaments, particularly in your ankles, hips, and knees. If you're going to be on your feet for a long period, of time, even like six weeks off, it's not like we're back at square one, but a lot of those critical adaptations, you know, hold on tightly, let go lightly. They're not totally gone, but they've lessened. My body has adapted quickly to being in this supine position on my couch. And now I've got to get it reused to keep bearing my body's weight in forward locomotion once more. And that's a process. To that end, if you are at that stage where your body is getting used to forward locomotion while bearing your body's weight on top of your ankles, it can be a little demoralizing to go a little more slowly than you want to go. I'm just begging you. Let's not do anything just because your muscles feel good. We can't move it. Like the limiting factor is really going to be the tendons, joints, and ligaments. They don't have a voice. They don't have blood flow. And they're not going to tell you that they're in danger until it's almost too late to do anything. And then you've got tendonitis and we got to take time off. So don't go out there like tempting bait and trying to get tendonitis because I didn't speak clearly about it or did not properly adapt the rule to the previous situation in a clear fashion last week. Because this is why I really don't like blanket rules. I would rather get the same question from seven different people because all of the context or the, the tweet required to get you where you need to go. It might sound like the same question, but it's going to get a very different answer. And that's generally why. The, what I, the advice I'm going to give Amy Wilson up in Maine on a day when she's having a bad long runner is facing a spate of bad weather is going to be decidedly different than what I tell, say, a Sarah Seberg who lives in Arizona. And all I know about is Arizona is like, oh, it's not humid, but it's a dry heat. And that's really great. But it's a heat heat that melts things like garbage cans and signs on the road. And I've seen that. So I would rather that was not happening to you internally. Let's try to like balance out what do we need to get not die is always going to be at the top of the list agree with that okay good so the next question hi coaches i am in a good running place right now i'm working my way back from injury with tenacity my plantar fasciitis is much improved i'm feeling stronger and faster than ever all the strength work is really helping me especially the strength accountability thread every day yay thank you for hey. saying that I appreciate hearing that My question is this. I don't know whether to do the strength beta or not. I'm doing 90% of the work, 90% of the time and maintain, but no hard speed work yet as I heal. I'm hoping to do a half at the end of September, which is halfway through the strength beta. I'm loving all the body weight and other exercises, but I'm not sure my body could handle the pace work of the plan. I'm guessing there'll be a lot of this. I don't know whether to do what I can in the strength beta or wait until I'm back to 100% fitness and just continue to work and maintain. One more request. Can you release a Bozu series as I love my Bozu? I think it has helped me recover from PF. I want to do more Bozu. Thank you. Hashtag coach and love. We actually have plans to do more BOSU uh, in the new year. We just want to be careful about how we roll it out so that we don't have people stacking all of the fun things on top of each other simultaneously. We can't really map out a good path forward until I have Coach Sarah full time. So know this, yes, there will be a special series. And I feel very cautious about this because the BOSU is a commitment. It takes up a lot of space. It's not free. It's not egregiously expensive, but it's not free and they don't go on sale that often. So uh, realizing before I'm like, in order to join this, you have to make a $100 purchase is not the method 
message yeah. I want to send. Yeah. And so I want to be very cautious about how I roll it out. But yes, uh, I hear you. I love the BOSU. I'm going to be on the BOSU a lot. I am going to be excited to get people on the BOSU with me because God knows I don't think uh, Coach Sarah can handle any more strength right now. I was like, <laughs> oh. Oh my gosh, so much strength. <laughs> so yeah, that'll that'll be coming back. As for um, the next question, I will probably going to avoid doing anything more than plyometrics, body weight work, and loops in the base subscriptions of maintain, rebuild, build, and run, run, interrupted, etc. And the reason for that is that I want to keep it as cheap as possible. There's yeah. no sense in me having a thirty dollar plan with you know an option in it if you have an extra hundred dollars to spend. I've seen how that worked in the past. I know how that made some people feel, and that is the opposite of what I want to be going for here. I would rather have an option that is separate and uh, sort of an, more of an upgrade rather than it, like making those for whom $30 a month is a stretch feeling otherized. Like I'm only doing part of it, not all of it because I can't afford that. So yeah, trying to yeah. stay away from that as much as humanly possible. I'm looking forward to bring back the Bosu because it is really valuable. But we can do great things without it. It's not like you are less than or are not getting your, your money's worth if you don't have space for or money for a Bosu ball. So yeah. when it comes to the strength beta though, that one's a lot of work and that one's going to be hard. If you are not feeling like you can do the really hard workouts and maintain right now, I would caution against the strength beta because they're going to be harder. Net, net, it's a little bit more total workout time, but it's also a little bit less running and the running that we do is going to be harder. Yeah. And remember that the strength beta is coming back around in January and I am going to be leading it and I'm going to be doing it. I cannot handle more strength right now, but in January, <laughs> that's going to be my middle name. So hang around because this is not your only chance. You don't have to do all of the things immediately when they come out. I will be with you in feeling a little bit of FOMO about it when it happens in September because I'm going to be a little bit sad that I'm not doing because I'm going to be in there coaching, but I'm not going to be doing it. And part of me is going to be like, uh, I know I have a race at the end of this month, but uh, I really wish I could do this cool stuff that Susan is doing. But hang in there with me. Like sit with that feeling and remember that January is not that far away. And if you're ready in January, you can do it with me in January. And if you're not ready in January, there'll be more chances in 2020. Perfectly stated. I think this is definitely a what do you want to do question. And it sounds like you kind of know what is best for you in this case. You're doing 90% of the work, 90% of the time maintained. That's awesome. A half the end of September. That's great. Also, that's off the table if you do the strength beta. That's not really negotiable, especially halfway through the strength beta. That's going to interfere with the entire purpose of doing the strength beta. And we're going to strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that people table all race plans until the end. I think that if you're in maintain and you're doing 90% of the work, 90% of the time, you are right where you need to be. And that is great. And sticking with that is going to set you up with really good things in the not so far off future. January is not that far away. When I look back and we talk about Wharton, where everything at Wharton is uh, graded on a bell curve. And my husband is very proud of the fact that he graduated with the median grade. And he's like, it was perfectly efficient. I did not work any harder than I had to in order to graduate. And I'm like, that's kind of a beautiful way of looking at it. And that's where the 75% of the work 95, 90% of the time came from. Yeah. If you have, that is your goal in a room full of overachievers, you're going to be right, right where you need to yeah. be. And you're so, going to be making good choices. Yeah. Yeah. That, that whole thing is I made it up and it's great. It's based on the grad school bell curve. <laughs> Yay. Love grad school. <laughs> okay. Yeah, last you don't question. need to do hundred percent of the work or hundred percent of the time. You are wasting oh. your time, effort, and energy. If you're doing hundred percent, that means you are not working efficiently. Yes. Yeah, that, that was absolutely my experience as well. Last questions. Any ideas to prevent the post-long run migraine headache? I've experienced migraines since puberty and regular running is helpful at preventing them except I still get them after long runs and harder effort workouts. I aggressively hydrate during the run, wearing my Nathan hydration pack for anything over an hour with noon, but I'm still getting them. Any ideas? I know you're not my doctor, et cetera, but thought maybe you or others have ideas I haven't tried Something I have heard a lot um, when it comes to migraine management is that it has to do more with what you ate the night before and the quality of the sleep that you got. Because migraines, they're, I don't have to tell you what they're like, they're, de they're debilitating and they seem, oh. the people who get them say that they can feel them coming on for a day or two before they actually kick in hard and start. My two cents would be to be aware of that and have some sort of a, I mean, not everything can be fixed with nutrition. I know I say that a lot, but some things can absolutely be worsened by it. If you click the link over here, it'll be in the show notes, but if you're in the Facebook Live right now and you see the link over here in the comments and sign 
up for the weekly mailing list, you're going to get a free gift, which is a downloadable PDF of the checklist of all of the little habits. We like to talk about running those though. It's one habit. That's really not true. In order to make running a sustainable habit, you have to need a whole host of picky little supporting habits, facilitate the running habit on a day-to-day basis. And one of them is making sure that you have uh, good nutritional options around most of the time and having a, a better system there. I also say in that document that like, you know, it's hard to talk about inflammation because we don't, doctors don't completely understand it yet. Same with toxins. All of us have been, that have been pregnant, you were probably told not to get a massage during the pregnancy because toxins. Meanwhile, you turn on the latest thing that's tearing Gwyneth Paltrow apart and they're like, what is a toxin? I don't know. And I'm like, well, gee, you're an OBGYN. Aren't you using that same word out of the same mouth telling people not to get massages? You tell me what toxins are. Like, you know, that is one inconsistency that I find really grating and I find it consistently everywhere, but not totally off point. I don't know what causes the inflammation that has led to arthritis in my first digit over here, but this knuckle is a mess and there are certain foods or certain times that trigger it and I know when they're coming. So I'm not trying to equivocate my arthritis in my one finger to a migraine, but I have a a good handle on what can make it worse. I can't fix it. We can't make it go away, but I know how not to make it worse and I, I avoid those things. I would think about like really coming up with some sort of a protocol that you know, even though it looks a whole lot like my ADHD management, like what do I need to not do keep from going into this area, which is again, not saying that this is your fault and that you're doing something wrong. But sometimes the whole story that I tell in that document about the night before that led to joint pain was just a little bit of not planning ahead. And I went ahead and changed my Instacart order and had it come in for the next morning. So I couldn't go another day without having a good meal as an option uh, before going to bed and having to grab another protein bar with too much sugar and it was going to set this off. It's not a perfect answer, but it's really, it's the best that we can do. Yeah. And unfortunately, this is one of those things that really is just kind of individual for everyone. I have my personal experience is that hydration is the really big piece of the post long run headache. I don't know if what I've experienced falls into the migraine category, though. I mean, that's a word that I hesitate to use because I have had bad headaches. But have I had migraines? I don't know. I hear that they're very debilitating. And I just like I hesitate to say, oh, yeah, me too. And, you know, equate what I have had to a migraine. It's a very common thing, though, to go for a run and finish and feel like somebody took, like, opened up your head, took out your brain, and tried to squeeze the juice out of it. I've had that feeling before, but those all came from the long runs before I got, you know, a thwack on the head from some of my teammates, some coach being like, you overdid it. Stop that. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, I know. But that's what the hit on the head was for, is to be like, oh, did that hurt? Kind of like yeah. when your mom yells it in your face when you had a hangover. Yeah, yeah. And the only thing in the summertime that guards against this is just like it is making sure that I hydrate the night before and the morning of before the run as well as during. I actually I don't have to do I'm, I'm lucky about this. I don't have to do a lot of hydration during the run. That's usually not a huge concern for me. But I do think that part of the reason for that is because I've been really, really attentive about making sure that I do like a big glass at noon the night before. And yeah, I'll have to get up and a couple of times in the night, which is not ideal the night before a long run, but that has guaranteed that I will be hydrated enough that I don't have that splitting headache thing going on. So yeah, I know. I'm unfortunately, that that is a part of who I am is that I, (laughs) I have a little bladder and I pee a lot, but I'm hydrated. You are amazing and we love you. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. My grandmother used to make fun of me, but um, <laughs> I was really self-conscious about it for a long time. My Nana, she would make, we'd go to a restaurant and I would always be like the first person to get up and go use the bathroom. And I mean, partly it's because like I'm at the restaurant with a bunch of grown up. I want something to do. Come back to the table. She'd be like, you are always going to the bathroom. And I'd be like, well, yeah, I know. I would have been like, I just don't want to be here. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, I just like I got to a certain point. Was an intimidating, intimidating person. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I did not I get want to it. Be made fun of. I just kind of hit a point when I was younger where I was like, if you're going to be mean either way, why should? Why wouldn't I bite back? Like, you guys need to think about your. You need to think about your parenting style. You seriously do. I'm going to be mean when I'm quiet and mean when I'm loud. Then guess what? I'm going to be more loud. That, that is not incentivizing me to stay quiet. They never liked that very much, understandably. But I stand by it now as an adult. Like, oh, wait, you, you think you're going to shame me into working hard? <laughs> I'm lazy. Have fun with that. So lazy. I got not proven myself to you. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, on that note, we have gotten through all of our questions and we are just under an hour here. How cool is that? It's amazing. I don't think we've ever done this before. I don't think we've ever done this before either. It was a quiet week and everyone benefits. Yay. Yay. I'll take it. It was just nice to kind of chill out and chat. Yeah. Yeah. And have Rob's coming. Mercury's out of retrograde, but there's still like something kind of hanging in the air. That's like, I feel like I'm just kind of waiting for it to shift. And I don't know if that's because I turn 41 next week. The Monday of your last week at Harvard is my, my 41st birthday. I am going to be thinking about that all day and not focusing on the fact that I'm supposed to be like holding it together for one more week. (laughs) I'm trying so hard not to just be a relent. I mean, I don't have to try very hard. I love the people I work with. They're wonderful. I'm not tempted to be a relentless jerk to them, but there is definitely part of me that's like, how many more days do I have to, you know, stand around and sit in these meetings and be like, yeah, uh uh-huh, uh-huh, mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love that feeling. <laughs> a lot of me. I do. Yeah. I've been very happy there this past year. I've been really lucky to work with, especially my, my direct supervisor who just started in March and he was a great hire. And I feel really glad about where he's taking the Harvard Language Center. And it's, it's all, it's all going to be in great hands. And I'm happy about that. And I'm also happy that I only have two more weeks of sitting in meetings about stuff that's going to happen this fall and smiling and nodding and really thinking about how much noon I'm going to have to drink tonight for my long run tomorrow. (laughs) I'm just saying, but you know, we're going to be talking about this for the rest of my life, right? Like you are Dr. Sarah Axelrod of Harvard University who quit Harvard to work with me. And that is like how I'm going to sign off all every email I ever write that is from both of us (laughs) into perpetuity. You just wait till I meet Oprah, man. That'll be like MK, who by the way, met Oprah Winfrey Winfrey once and who works with Dr. Sarah Lauren. (laughs) (laughs) well i have the phd it's printed on very heavy paper and they're not taking it away from me and it's in latin so you know what right they want if they can't take it they wouldn't know what it was exactly who reads latin (sighs) well i do second to last week (laughs) thank you (laughs) everybody know that you are coached you are loved you are winning at life and you don't need a phd from harvard to do the work that you do definitely Uh, not i definitely think it's a selling point (laughs) i don't know if y'all heard i got adhd i cannot be trusted thank god i'm balanced out by harvard phd over here it takes that to deal with them cat yeehaw yeehaw go read some latin enjoy (laughs) your night (laughs) you too